Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Today, our guest is Jean Manuel Robineau. He's the author of The Dangerous Life and Ideas of Diogenes the Cynic. It's published by Oxford University Press. It'll be released later this month. So when we think of Diogenes, if we do at all in this day and time, we think of him as, yes, the founder of cynicism, but we also think of him as kind of a, I don't know, not someone you'd really want to hang around with. He, he urinated in the marketplace, we may know. He masturbated in the marketplace. He ate food. He gave people the middle finger. He was not a nice guy. At least that's the way the anecdotal stuff comes down to us. He insulted everyone from Plato to Alexander the Great. He would insult anyone. <laughs> he uh, he brought a featherless uh, chicken to the academy, which changed the definition of a man. We can get into that. Um, and he, he he lived in a he lived in a jar, theoretically a barrel, but barrels didn't exist then. But anyway, as usual, I am going on saying the things that I'm going to be asking questions to John Manuel about. So let me ask you first, um, why did you, you know, looking on the internet, there's not much in America about you because most of it's in French, which I can't read. But um, why are you so interested in Diogenes or, or for that matter, even Greek philosophy? So, so my uh, starting point was uh, um, an interest for mendicancy, in fact. So I was uh, uh, studying uh, uh, the, the way beggars were living in ancient cities. And then I realized that Diogenes has never been uh, studied in a historical point of view. Uh, lots of people have studied his uh, philosophy, the body of doctrine of uh, cynicism, but the, the life of Diogenes in itself has uh, never been really uh, uh, studied uh, and uh, put in context. So my, my interest came from, from there. I was trying to understand how uh, Diogenes could have made uh, mendicancy a positive behavior while in uh, ancient cities, uh, beggars were really, really badly considered and mistreated on an everyday uh, basis. So my starting point was that, to, to understand how the cynic philosophy has um, inverted the relationship to uh, mendicancy. Uh, considering that uh, in ancient times, this was extremely negative to be a beggar, but in medieval times, the same uh, name was describing a very different reality uh, because it, under the Christian era, um, um, beggars were used to um, help people to buy a better uh, afterlife. So they were a kind of positive part of society. And this, this way to, uh, to be considered at the same time as a beggar and a useful actor of the city is basically invented by Diogenes. So uh, that's why I was searching for, to understand how we, how we did that transformation. Yeah, it reminds me of um, one of the things he said about slavery, about it's better to remain a slave than to stop being a slave and remember that you were a slave. And some of this is almost, it's almost like postmodern now in terms of almost like a meta kind of feel, you know, like, you have to think about what he's saying for a while to kind of understand exactly what he means. And um, throughout the book, there are so many of those examples, as, as it is whether you're talking about Archimedes, you know, here, here's Archimedes, who's like Elon Musk. And, uh, and you have this whole uh, civilization that did so much over a period of time that, that we lost so much of too. But so Diogenes though, at the same time, he was arguing against most of what was considered proper at the time. He was attacking rather than defending the, 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 the accepted norm in Greece, correct? Yeah, exactly. That's the main point of uh, cynicism to, uh, uh, to destroy one by one uh, every um, convention of urban life. Uh, meaning uh, cynic philosophers were contesting uh, the marriage, the principle of uh, getting married. They were con contesting the idea of, uh, uh, on the aim of uh, uh, producing offspring. Uh, they were contesting the, the, the idea of intimacy and the difference between 
public and private. So you were uh, talking about urinating in public or masturbating. This is uh, one of the consequences when you decide to make no difference between home and outside. There are some kind of uh, basic consequences, including these ones. So uh, yes, cynicism uh, um, was spending, uh, cynics were spending a lot of time um, uh, deconstructing the, the, the conventions on the pillars of the everyday uh, everyday life. Absolutely. But I, I guess some people might say, to what end? Because if Plato's saying, this is a table form, this is a chair form, and Diogenes is saying, no, it's a table and chair, and Plato says, that's because you're an idiot, basically, and you don't have a brain to see the table form. So to what end is Diogenes trying, if you deconstruct something, the universe, then what's left and what's the point? Yeah, the, the point was to to invite everyone uh, to to search for a philosophical way of life. So the idea was to take away everything that was considered as a kind of illusion. So lots of uh, um, aims that people had in life were considered by the cynics, by Diogenes, uh, as illusions. Meaning, if you search for wealth. Wealth is an illusion. If you search for glory, glory is an illusion. If you search for a better social status, this is an illusion again. So the the, the point of cynicism was to uh, to go back uh, to nature and to go back to simplicity. So th they were trying Diogenes first to uh, take away everything that was not um, according to nature. But if you take an American like Thoreau living in the woods, and having this peaceful meditative uh, life in which he just, as I'm doing now, looking out my window at the trees and just enjoying the moment. It never seems to be that, that Diogenes re reaches a moment of peace, of rest. He's always attacking, as I said earlier. Like, like even when, he, even when um, he has his one bowl and then he sees the boy using his hands to drink water and he throws away his bowl because he says what an idiot he was. Yes. He goes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, he, he, in fact, he, um, he had some peace too. Uh, so he was attacking when he was uh, um, fulfilling his his, uh, his mission, the kind of apostolic mission of the uh, cynic. He was attacking all the time. He was quite brutal, intemperate, uh, unpolite. So he was a kind of a, a bad version of Socrates. Uh, Plato said it, he was a Socrates gone mad uh, because he had no manners. Uh, but uh, at the same time. Uh, Diogenes, um, um, I don't know how to say that, um, kept part for pleasure in his life. Uh, many, uh, for example, you, you talked about Alexander, the encounter with Alexander the Great. Uh, when Alexander uh, met Diogenes, Diogenes was uh, on the Craneion, which is a kind of hillside uh, out of uh, Corinth, the city of Corinth on the Isthmus, uh, and he was um, taking the sun. He was resting and uh, staying quiet and peaceful and just enjoying the, the moment and the, the sun of the day. So uh, there, there is no, he's uh, not refusing pleasure in life. And this is a big difference with his uh, uh, teacher, his master, Antisthenes, who was kind of a, a first, who created a kind of very first version of cynicism and who was um, rejecting the idea of pleasure. He considered that cynicism has to go um, to pain. Uh, onto mortification in a way, which Diogenes didn't do. So you had the two sides of the cynic life. You have the uh, attacking and brutal uh, side uh, when uh, cynics were in contact with people, and you had the uh, pleasure part of life, uh, the, the simple pleasure part of life. But the, but the problem is, is that, okay, he's enjoying his moment lying in the sun, but he can't help when Alexander the Great, the greatest man in the world, says, "This is there anything I can do for you?" Because yeah, get out of get out of the light. And then Alexander says, "If I wasn't Alexander the Great, I would be Diogenes." And Diogenes says, "If I wasn't Diogenes, I would be Diogenes." So it's like it, it's almost like a Zen koan where the, the pupil comes to the master and says, "You know, how can I seek enlightenment?" And the master takes a stick and hits him on the head. It's it's like that. He he can't help himself from. Being an asshole. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. There must have been some kind of psychological uh, uh, complicated part of Diogenes that we don't uh, really completely grasp. But uh, but yes, yes, he was uh, not an easy guy to uh, to live with on a daily basis. That's for sure. Uh, the thing is, he, he made uh, he made that kind of uh, brutality a tool uh, for philosophical. Right. So, and uh, this is linked with uh, the idea that uh, uh, in the um, scenic point of view, uh, the, the philosophy is not a kind of, um, it's not a doctrine or just a kind of a, a theoretical ideology. It has to be um, a philosophy in action. So every day at any time, you can be a philosopher yourself or any day at any time, you can help someone to um, come to philosophy. So that's why it's kind of, kind of constant um uh, scourge uh in, in with uh is a fellow uh not citizens because he was not a citizen but the inhabitants of Athens or current where he was living most of the time so sure, well based on that let's go ahead and go back which i probably should have started with first and talk about his life and how a lot of it stemmed from his visit visit to the oracle and uh, uh debasing currency and then we can move on from there because that's a good way to start Yes, uh, so so uh, an oracle is supposed to have told uh, um, Dogenes that he was supposed to uh, um, to twist the uh, nomisma, uh, which which he understood as a reference to the money of the city, and which was in fact a reference to the law of the city, because the term can be used to to point at coins or to point at laws and customs. Uh, so this is the oracle part of the story, but the oracle part is it must be or might be a kind of um, apocryphal uh, uh, history added after. The original story is that uh, Diogenes and, and his father were, li were living in Sinop, which is a city on the um, uh, Black Sea on the south of the Black Sea, and uh, he, they were living there, and uh, uh, Diogenes' father, Ecclesias, was uh, what Greek call trapezites, meaning a kind of guy who was changing money uh, on the agora, because when you come to a market in the ancient times, you cannot use the money you came with, you have to use the local coins, the local money, that there is no choice. So there were some uh, people, uh, civil servants, who were working uh, on fulfilling that mission. And uh, uh, the thing is, the story tells us that uh, Diogenes' father or uh, Diogenes' father on Diogenes have uh, counterfeited uh, the coins and they produce some uh, spurious coins instead of the genuine ones. And uh, that's, that's the beginning of the story, which is a very um, big crime in uh, uh, Greek cities to, to change the quality of uh, money is not a, a, um, like a, a secondary matter. And the consequence is uh, Diogenes had to, to leave, to escape from his city, not to be put in jail or executed. And that's the beginning of his uh, second life, meaning the philosophical life, because uh, after this exile, he lost his position in his city, uh, the relationship with his family, and uh, then he became um, a mendicant, a beggar. For the rest of his life, basically, he moved from Sinop to the south of Greece, so to Athens, Corinth, central Greece, and uh, then he began a philosophical life. So for, for a very long time, this anecdote of uh, uh, Diogenes um, counterfeiting uh, the, the coins of Sinop has been considered as a kind of uh, um, empty legend. And uh, the thing is, there is no reason to, to treat it as a legend, because uh, uh, as long as the father was uh, working uh, with coins, uh, he, was, he had the possibility and uh, he must have the ability to uh, counterfeit coins. So, and we have some uh, parallels in the ancient times. When people counterfeit coins, most of them are already working on a, a regular basis with producing and changing coins. So uh, it must be, it, it could be at least a true story. But then after that, legend came. And uh, the Greeks, they love to explain um, behaviors and origin of things uh, with oracles. So this is with Diogenes, but we have a, a lot of parallels with other philosophers. Uh, Socrates is supposed to have begun to be a philosopher after an oracle. Zenon, uh, the founder of the Stoic uh, philosophical school too. So uh, uh, this, is a, this is kind of a topos in the philosophical uh, history, ancient history, that uh, uh, heavy decisions are taken 
after an oracle. It, you use two words, apocryphal and anecdotal. And that's something that I always have a problem with um, in reading um, the ancients because there are no surviving writings, even though he's supposed to have written seven books and all these treatises. There's no surviving writings. There's people who wrote about him. And then we need to explain that the person who wrote about him that you're relying on is also named Diogenes because that's going to be confusing. Yes. Um, so, so why do you believe uh, as a scholar that you can rely on secondhand or thirdhand uh, recountings, just like the Gospels, for example, as being relatively authentic and, and talk about the other Diogenes? Um, um, so, 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 so the other, the other, sorry, Diogenes, so Diogenes from uh, uh, Lachios, so it's a city in uh, Asia Minor, was a kind of uh, um, scholar who, who made a kind of history of uh, a philosophical school uh, from the beginning, from the 6th century BC to his time. He was writing during uh, the 3rd century after Christ, uh, Diogenes uh, from the city of Lachios. Um, so he, he gave us the biggest uh, historical portrait uh, of uh, of Diogenes, the philosopher, the cynic, um, but he is uh, very often quoting his sources. So um, we have some uh, possibilities to to cross uh, documents and to cross sources. So um, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, we can have a decent idea uh, if the the information is um, credible. Or not so uh, because we have kind of uh, it is possible in a scientific point of view to check uh, some of uh, uh, Diogenes Laertius sayings not always uh, and when we we have also um, Arabic papyri uh, who have from the 9th to 12th century after Christ uh, who have conserved uh, gathered um, uh, sayings from Diogenes and sometimes we can uh, we have the same in uh, ancient Greek source or in uh, ancient Latin source. And so, and so we can check. And sometimes it's checked perfectly. And sometimes you see that something has twisted uh, in, in between. So, but it's not, uh, I mean, it's not um, astrophysic. You, 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 you cannot know for sure every time you have an information on Diogenes, uh, if uh, the information is completely accurate or a bit uh, legendarized. You, you, we have some kind of legendarization, and uh, sometimes a saying by Dio, to, by Diogenes is also attributed to Crates, his pupil, or to Antisthenes, his uh, master, or to Socrates. Uh, so uh, you have this kind of movement uh, in the uh, philosophical sayings of the fifth, fourth, third century BC. What if you have? Um, well, let's take a, a minor point which you discuss in the book, which is that, okay, it, it's rather prosaic, but the fact that, okay, did he live or use as his shelter a jar or a yeah. barrel? And then, but, but you guys discussed it as if it's, well, it is meaningful, but then you have to discuss whether barrels existed at the time that someone says he existed in a barrel. Yeah, I try to to make the story of that uh, myth in 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 the book. The 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 um, that we often talk about Dogenes barrel and in the um, modern pictures paintings you have a lot of barrels too, and the problem is you don't have any wooden barrel in the ancient world before the first century BC. The first references to barrels are uh, in Caesar works, Julius Caesar works, and and, uh, and we have, uh, in an archaeological point of view, the, the most ancient barrels uh, are uh, from the uh, first century BC to no, no barrels at the fourth century BC when uh, Diogenes was living. He was living three centuries before the first barrel. Uh, and then uh, I try to, to see how this myth uh, appeared and it's a kind of translation issue. Uh, Senec at the first century after Christ and then after lui, after him, sorry, Juvenal um, was trying to translate in Latin the word uh, in Greek saying uh, jar and in, in Greek it's, you say pitos and in Latin he, he used the word dolium which means barrel because there was no appropriate term in Latin to say 
big jaw, big ceramic jaw. And, uh, but when Seneca and Juvenal did that, they knew they were uh, um, going away from the or original term. They were perfectly conscious of that. But after that, the, the, the term was used on a regular basis. And at the end, people believed that Diogenes was living in a wooden barrel. So it's a kind of long story. But what is interesting is uh, the idea of living in a, in a jar is not so bizarre uh, because we can we can trace back the history of this kind of uh, uh, lodging uh, um, because uh, it appeared in our documents uh, not a century before Diogenes, during the war of the Peloponnesus, um, so meaning between 431 and 404 before Christ, Athens was uh, at war against uh, Sparta and um, the, the leader of Athens, Pericles, uh, decided of a kind of uh, bold strategy, um, gathering all the inhabitants of Athens inside the long walls of the city. So inside the, the um, not the city, but the, uh, the urban part of the city, if you want. And the thing is, um, because of that, there was not enough house for everyone or not enough beds. So uh, people began to build tents, began to find uh, uh, cab cabins, li little uh, um, provisory way to 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 sleep, to have a roof uh, uh, up to your head, and uh, the jars were used at the time. So we have documents telling us that some Athenians, some Athenian citizens, uh, has been have been forced to live inside uh, ceramic jars during the uh, Peloponnesian War. So when Diogenes some decades later, decides to live in a ceramic jar is not the first. And for Athenians, for Athenian people, it's nothing really strange to see someone uh, deciding to live in a ceramic jar because it's been seen before and people have talked about it since the Peloponnesian War. It doesn't seem like it would be that bad. I mean, <laughs> from what I've read, you could stay, and there people were shorter then too, so you could stand up in it. And it's like people in America now building these small houses, of, you know, tiny house. Yes. Yeah. If you put a nice curtains on the wall and you, you could almost make it homey. <laughs> I don't know if it was super homey, but it, at least it was uh, possible. It was possible. And the thing it's really high, you know, the it's storage uh, jars. So they were most of the time uh, they were put um, part of it was in the ground. Uh, part of the jar was uh, uh, in, inside the ground to, to get it cooler and to get it more stable. But uh, we have some left. Uh, some of them have been uh, um, uh, transmitted by archaeological uh, sites. And uh, we, we, we have some jars who can go higher than two meters. So you, you, can, you can live, you can sleep uh, in a jar. It's, uh, it's really uh, super wide uh, and you have uh, in Crete, we have uh, in uh, archeological sites in Crete, we have a lot of this kind of jars and they are extremely big. Oh, so as you, so, okay. So as you were doing your research and you know, many of the stories about Diogenes, some of the ones in the introduction perhaps are more legend than fact. So when you're sifting through all of this, what kind of process did you use to separate what you thought? Okay, I don't think I'll put this in here because I don't have as much certainty about this as I do about this. Yeah, uh, uh, the thing is, uh, the, the question is, um, in fact, what is important is to identify the question you can get an answer. Uh, I mean, uh, sometimes you have a kind of anecdote. You won't be sure that it happened to Diogenes but you can be sure that this is revealing something about Diogenes society. So um, most of the anecdotes are not really useful to uh, establish um, a kind of uh, point or information about Diogenes life, but they are useful to, um, to understand better um, one uh, aspect of the social life of ancient Greeks. Um, I will... Um, uh, I would like to try to find an example. Um, I don't know what would be. Uh, yes, I, yes, for an example, um, Diogenes was uh, um, 
using, at least the legend says that he was using statues in gymnasium in the in the palestra uh, area where where uh, young and less young people were training for sports, and uh, in the gymnasium statues were used to uh, work some movement. So when you have human side statues, at least were using them to. Um, uh, to work on techniques and movements and change of movements with the statue. So they were using statues as tools for training. That's we know, we have documents telling us that. And uh, what Diogenes was doing is uh, waiting for the statues in winter to be covered with ice or snow and uh, embracing them to um, um, improve his ability to endure. Uh, the cold and the freeze. So we cannot be sure that he did that, but uh, what is interesting is he was uh, using a kind of uh, uh, athletic exercise uh, or he was trying to use the athletic exercise to uh, make it useful, not for athletic purpose, but for philosophical purpose. And that's the way he was doing philosophy. He was using social actions of everyday life and he was twisting them and giving them a new uh, purpose, a new intention. And this is uh, quite sure, but we cannot be sure that Diogenes himself has, was really grasping or embracing statues when they were covered with uh, snow. What I mean is when the story tells us that he was doing that, we cannot be sure that he did that, but we can link that with the athletic exercise and we can show that the statues in the uh, palastre and the, the sport areas were um, not uh, uh, let far behind from human, but were part of the social life and the sport life and the body uh, training life. Well, if that's okay, that's a good one to explain that. That's a good anecdote for that one. But what about when he's actually confronting a philosophical point head on, but it's portrayed as an anecdote? So why don't you tell the one about Plato and the fe the biped and the feathered biped and what he did in, in turn and how that changed things and why it's important and why, again, the sense of humor is so important to it. Yeah, so, so, so this anecdote is uh, um, Diogenes uh, couldn't stand Plato. Uh, Plato and uh, he, he, this, he, so he was constantly attacking him and attacking his philosophy. That is quite for sure. And uh, the legend says that uh, uh, Plato has provided the definition of man, saying that the man was a featherless biped. And uh, uh, Diogenes took a rooster and uh, plucked the, 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 the rooster and, uh, and then said, this is the man of Plato to make fun of me, to make him ridiculous. So uh, we cannot be absolutely sure that he did that this cannot be established but what we are sure of is that he was constantly attacking him on every way every part of his philosophy so on his life too so he was uh, mocking uh, the the love for comfort of uh, plato for example he was mocking his relationship with sicilian tyrants uh, for uh, example, or he was mocking the fact that there was a, a huge discrepancy uh, between um, what Plato said and what uh, Plato did. So uh, in Diogenes' point of view, uh, the philosophy has to be demonstrated in action. You can be just a scholar and speak theoretically, but you have to show in, your, uh, in every action of yours uh, that you are a philosopher. So this is uh, sure, and the, the, the opposition is that uh, in Plato's uh, approach, you need more or less 50 years to be a decent philosopher and a teacher and to be able to govern the city because you are enough educated. And to Plato, that's the absolute, to Diogenes, sorry, that's the absolute contrary. You, have, you can be um, a philosopher at the minute you decide to become a philosopher. You won't be a great philosopher. You won't be a perfect philosopher at the beginning, but you can live a life of philosophy from the very, very beginning. That's why uh, there is a stoic philosopher, Apollodorus, who said that uh, um, cynicism was a, a shortcut to virtue. You, you didn't need a kind of very long uh, uh, training and education process 
to get access to, to philosophy. So to go back to your uh, featherless biped, the, we, this is impossible to, uh, to establish firmly. We, we can't know if uh, Diogenes really did this. Uh, uh, what we know is someone at least had the idea at some point and put it in the legend, that's for sure. Maybe Diogenes said so. But what we are sure of is that he was attacking constantly uh, Plato and considering, me, considering him that a, a very useless man. Well, the, and the, my favorite part of the story is I can just see a scribe with a tablet writing down, we need to add that he has, a man has broad, flat nails, because it's like they had to put an addendum in order to further quantify what a man was. That's my favorite part of it. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, the, the, what? Okay, so because, because uh, Diogenes did this, yes. uh, the definition no longer held, so they had yes. to to say that the vibe had also had to have couldn't have claws they would have to have fingernails fingernails yes 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 um so it, if you continue on the philosophical bent and how things transformed i never understood what you talk about a little bit and i also tried to research how the stoics were so fond of Diogenes and why Stoicism, which I never realized, actually stood on the shoulders of cynicism. Uh, this is a completely different <laughs> matter. I'm not sure I am able to to respond firmly on that, but this is a um, this is a question of uh, uh, intellectual inheritance. Uh, the, the, uh, there is a kind of chain. Uh, uh, between philosophers from the end of the uh, fifth century to the to the uh, beginning of the third century, so uh, the Stoics and the Cynics are, uh, in a way, uh, inheritance uh, of uh, disciples of uh, Socrates. All of them in different ways. So Socrates had uh, Antisthenes as a pupil, and Antisthenes had uh, who might have Diogenes as a pupil. Diogenes had Crates. Who still was a cynic, but one of uh, Crates' uh, pupils was Zeno, the founder of the Stoic, uh, of the Stoic uh, philosophical school. So um, the the there are some uh, uh, difference uh, through times between the two philosophy who got separated more and more. But in fact, they have basically the same uh, origin, which is a Socratic uh, philosophy. So there is a kind of uh, uh, I don't know to say that better, but a uh, uh, historical link or like genetic a, link between them. Like a, we would say like a family tree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to, to, uh, let's go back to his real life again and talk about how, because of um, the difficulty with the, the coinage, with the, the money, that uh, eventually he became a slave and then how he was sold and how he, uh, again, sarcastically told the master that he was going to be his master. Yes, so he, he, uh, it happened to Diogenes what happened to thousands and thousands of people in ancient Greece uh, over centuries. Uh, he's been abducted, abducted by pirates, which was really uh, uh, frequent. Lots of people have been abducted. And uh, you, then when you were abducted, two solutions, either the pirates were waiting, uh, uh, not so far from the shore, and waiting from, uh, for money, to give back people that, that they had abducted. Or the other solution was pirates were leaving as far as possible from the place where they uh, uh, had been uh, taking some people and enslaved people, going away and selling those people on slave markets in different uh, islands of an area uh, in the Aegean Sea. So this is what happened to Diogenes. He was uh, on his way to Aegina. And he's been abducted then, and then he's been, he's been sold uh, so, to, to, a, to a Corinthian master, Xeniades, who might have been a philosopher himself. But it's a complicated matter because there is an homonym uh, person uh, who was a philosopher, but we, not, we don't know for sure if Xeniades was uh, the same Xeniades as the one who owned uh, Diogenes. But to go back to your question, uh, yes, uh, the, the idea of uh, Diogenes is that the status, citizen, resident foreigner, uh, free man, slave, etc., was of no importance. And in fact, you anyone could get 
the level of freedom that he would uh, grasp. Uh, so, uh, meaning to Diogenes, you're a slave, uh, whatever is your status, or you're free, whatever is your status. Uh, meaning that if you are a citizen, very rich in your city, but if you are totally uh, dependent of uh, your um, your needs on the uh, of certain kind of pleasures, certain kinds of comfort, etc., then in a way, in the scenic eyes, you are more a slave than a slave could be himself. So the the experience of slavery of Diogenes is the beginning of a kind of a speculation about what is freedom and what is uh, slavery. So the, the ancient uh, cities where the Greek cities were really strongly uh, structured uh, around the opposition between free people on slave uh, people. But uh, what is interesting is Diogenes, is Diogenes is, is just a kind of very good example of uh, one person who moved from one position to the other. So he was a citizen in Sinop, then he was a foreigner in Athens and Corinth, and then he was a slave, and then he was freed by his master, and he was a free man at that time. So uh, he's a good example of the mobility of population and the change of social status in one's mind uh, life. And this is quite frequent. The, the idea that you, uh, you might fall in slavery at some point in your life, the risk to fall in slavery is a risk that is really uh, um, here uh, in the head of every inhabitant. And the possibility for a slave to um, get out of your slavery is also uh, really present in the um, in the life and the social life uh, and, and normally a slave is supposed to be enfranchised to be uh, freed uh, at some point in the second part of his life it, if he did good job so if he as a person if he went through these all these incarnations of being a different type whether he's as you said a, a foreigner a citizen a slave uh, a master, um, is is that kind of a portent nomen uh, of the fact that he's saying it doesn't really make much difference? It doesn't make much difference which of those you are. Is that like part of his lesson that it doesn't make any difference which of those you are? At yes. All? Yeah, th th exactly. The point is to be detached of this kind of uh, contingency. It is not important in one's in one's mind life. Um, to be a citizen or foreigner or a slave. It is not a, a big issue. You, you have to deal with the position you have at the time and you can be uh, um, as free as a free man when you are a slave if you want to. Uh, meaning that uh, uh, in Diogenes' um, um, theoretical conception, uh, slavery is a state of mind. Is not a status. So in that point, is is extremely modern. Is considering that the there is a kind of uh, wisdom in, inside of each man um, that will make possible to uh, um, to win uh, to get over a difficult situation. Whatever is your situation, you can get over it. But the, the issue I've always had with that is because I kind of have always liked the idea of. Platonic spheres, Platonic forms, uh, Platonic ideals, and obviously, as we've been discussing, uh, Diogenes thought that was ridiculous, and Plato thought that Diogenes was ridiculous. But how does that all fit in? Because if you look at this idea of a table form, or there's a true table somewhere existing, all we're seeing, you know, where the where the people sitting in the cave, with with the fire behind us and looking at the shadow, the shadows of the cave. And is Diogenes basically saying, who cares? I don't really care whether the shadows of the cave, I don't care if it's the real thing, just get on with life living. Is it something like that? Yeah, the, the, the thing is, is, is for, for in Diogenes conception and in scenic conception, uh, if an ID has no effect on the everyday life, it's, it's useless. So as long as it doesn't help you to be self-sufficient and to be free, and to be freed from uh, illusory uh, or ridiculous aims in life, glory, power, social status, etc. Um, that's if if it doesn't help, it's useless. 
So uh, Diogenes, in fact, is at the same time very educated, and at the same time, he considers that uh, intellectual speculation uh, is uh, a useless activity. So you, you're supposed to, uh, to, to live a life of philosophy. It's useless to have uh, big and very uh, uh, complex and smart ideas about how things work, what is an idea, what is the world or the illusion of the world. You have to cope with reality and you have to be able to be self-sufficient. If you have just some salted fish for lunch, that's it. If you have some bread, that's it. If you have some wine, great, but you don't need wine. So if you don't have wine, that's it. So the, 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 the idea of the cynic philosophy is really to focus on the action, on the everyday action. So it's, uh, again, it's really not, we, we, we modern, we have a tendency, and I do it too, to, to convert the cynicism in a body of doctrine. So we need to, um, to find kind of list of ideas who are, um, if you gather them, who are expressing the, um, the art of the cynic uh, philosophy, but for the cynics, so the doctrine was not so important. Uh, you could think about doctrine, but the, the point was to uh, to put it in uh, in reality. So uh, there was no philosophy, but uh, in action. So Plato is uh, to Diogenes is a lost cause. Is a lost cause uh, really because he's spending a lot of time uh, building uh, philosophical systems as we'll do much later, the German philosophy, for example. So uh, extremely complex philosophical systems, but we are, which are basically useless for uh, people who need to face everyday life uh, issues. So it's two approach of uh, philosophy. It's not, uh, the cynic philosophy is a philosophy of life. I, I, I think I'm beginning to understand because now I'm kind of thinking of it in terms of Aesop's fables. If you think of the anecdotes, like for example, He's at the well, he has his ball. The boy is there like this, and he throws away the ball. Now, I have no idea whether that happened. You have no idea whether that happened. But it does explain what you've just explained, that there is no need for the ball. What a fool I've been using this ball when I could have been doing it this way all along. But it didn't have to happen, right, in real life. Yeah, we, yes, we don't know if it really happened. What we know is uh, the life uh, of a life of begging was a life with a very short list of items. So they had one cloak, no tunic. So you know, in, in Greece, uh, you are if if the weather is good, you have one tunic. If the weather is uh, cold, so autumn, winter, you will have a tunic, and then over it a cloak. And the the cynic have. Um, um been used to use only one piece of garment so only a cloak and when it was too cold they were folding the cloak and uh, if they use it as a blanket on the blanket sorry or they use it as a mattress if they needed it and uh, that's it that was the furniture and then they had uh, a stick to walk and then they had uh, what we call in greek a para mean a uh, kind of traveling bag uh um, a traveling bag where you could put some um, some stuff, meaning a, a piece of cheese, uh, a cup until he stopped using cups, uh, uh, some bread if you someone gave you some bread, um, this kind of stuff. So you had to travel light. So we we cannot be sure if Diogenes uh, broke his cup or gave his cup to someone. That can be sure. But what is sure is he had a life with a very short number uh, of items. Degrowth. Uh, specialist today will, could take him as a model because he was living with a, uh, not a tiny house, a tiny, tiny, tiny house, if you want. Yes, he was the true first minimalist. Yes, um, in a way. Well, it's, it's funny because, as I was saying in the introduction, when you say to someone, don't be so cynical, it, you're definitely, it's a mild insult, but it is an insult nonetheless. So if we, first of all, owning a bookstore, and second of all, knowing that my readers and, and uh, customers are going to be asking questions about the book and they're gonna, they always say the same thing. So what, what's, what message is the author trying to say about today's modern material, materialistic world and you know, the barrel and discarding most of societal norms? So what do we bring into the modern world with that? What's the lesson that, what's the lesson that we can still learn from him if you still believe there's a substantive lesson 
that he is teaching us. Yes, I, I see. You you can use uh, cynic philosophy as a model. Uh, that's a choice. I don't I don't recommend cynic philosophy as a model. But if you want to use it, you can. So I, I think I would say that there are maybe two main um, directions. The first is the relationship with comfort. We are in a society where comfort is extremely uh, important. So we 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 like comfort. We search for comfort, and uh, uh, we buy uh, lots of clothes. We like to be to live in uh, big apartments or big house. We like we etc cetera, etc cetera, to have good food. Uh, so there is a kind of uh, appetite for comfort. So uh, cynic the cynic philosophy and Diogenes in particular is providing a kind of uh, uh, counter model to that uh, and is is uh, defending the idea that comfort is a kind of prison so i would say that this is maybe one of the uh, philosophical directions that you can uh, that you can uh, follow and well, uh, yes i was just going to say if he saw us if he could come to our our place here if he saw us what well suppose he saw artificial intelligence forget the material stuff forget automobiles and forget iPhones and forget beautiful jewelry, but suppose just artificial intelligence, the concept of it, or just the fact that you and I are talking one-on-one, -on -one, but the entire world can hear and see us. Would he say to us, you both are fools. Why are you even talking? There's no point. You're not learning anything. What would, what would he do? Would he just, would he break my computer and say, yes, he would. He would take this laptop and pick it up and break it. Would he not? He will, he will attack you on maybe several things. He will say that uh, uh, books have to be to uh, everyone and uh, you don't need to sell 100 copies of Diogenes. Sell one and everyone will pass it on. So, so I'm trying to, sell, <laughs> trying to sell your book. You're <laughs> ruining it. <laughs> so, so, so no, I, 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 say, I think that the... Uh, the, the, the most important part to um, at least at least to to my eyes is that uh, is uh, the ability to uh, question the norms and the conventions of social life the, the, so, so, so the, um, the what is very interesting with cynicism is that strong ability to to see what are the conventions and to uh, try to uh, unbuild them and show how artificial they are. So, so I think uh, um, when uh, Diogenes is contesting the idea of marriage and, or the idea of property uh, or the idea of uh, intimacy, for example, of the idea of having offspring, uh, this is very interesting because it helps uh, uh, it has helped the people of his society to uh, see better uh, that their society was a kind of cultural construct. Uh, it was not the only way to do things, and it has not forever been the way to do things. So uh, I think it's always very useful to, um, to have this kind of um, ability to put your own uh, uh, customs and your own conventions um, away from yourself to have a kind of distant look at least for a time from your own conventions. So this is modern. I mean, this could be uh, used uh, basically in every culture or every historical society uh, today. So that's 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 a, a very strong uh, idea. The problem is, is that it never seems to happen. I mean, what it really is, is a question... I believe, of perspective, which I think now talking to you, I think what one of the things Diogenes had was perspective, the ability to step away. And like, for example, in America, we just had this thing called the Met Gala, where all the movie stars come and they get dressed up and they spend a fortune. You just had the Cannes Film Festival, which I guess is still going on. Yes. And everyone comes, it's jets, private jets, caviar, beautiful clothes. They give Johnny Depp a seven minute standing ovation for a and he, okay, yeah, he would go in there and it'd be like Jesus in the temple but with the money changers. He would go in and he would, th he would throw paint on their dresses. He would destroy the, the, the projectors. He would do all those things. But to what, as I said earlier, to what end? It, it, it's decon he attempts to deconstruct. He would be arrested. He would be put in jail. But his theory then is the same as it would be now. All this is nonsense. It's absurd. Why are you doing it? But it's never stopped this from continuing and getting worse as we go along, especially given the fact that in America, there's really no civil discourse. Yes, 
Yeah, I understand what you mean. Oh, 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 yes, for sure. If Diogenes was coming to Cannes, um, he, he would uh, make a mess of the uh, red carpet um, uh, protocol. That's that's for sure. And there is a, there are different reasons for that. But the main reason is he would uh, uh, criticize the search for glory. Uh, the, the people who are coming, the actors, they search for glory. They want to to um, make a mark. Uh, they want to be remembered because of their art uh, uh, actions, because of their acting. And uh, that would be something the organist should consider a problem. So, of course, he would uh, make uh, fun of them. He, he made fun of uh, uh, the, the main stars of the ancient times, the athletes, and, uh, and their, their obsession uh, to, uh, to win uh, competitions, con athletic contests, epic contests, musical contests, etc. And uh, he, he was saying that the, the crowns that athletes were uh, getting when they were winning a competition was uh, use the expression. I, I I'm not sure what it is. In, it would say in English, but it's something like uh, "pustules of fame." <laughs> And uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, yeah, he, he was super critical to uh, obsessions, to uh, illusory um, uh, aims in life. And glory was one of them. So Hollywood actors will definitely uh, fall into that category, obsession for glory. It's funny. Are you familiar with um, the American comedian George Carlin? I'm not sure. Anyway, he's, he was a curmudgeon of sorts, and I can't think of who would be comparable in Paris and France, but he basically lampooned society, lampooned rich people, lampooned religion, lampooned everything. And I just realized he was kind of effective because he had an audience. The audience would leave his performance thinking about what he had said. So I guess, let me ask you this, who in France or anyone you might know in America, who portrays as close to Diogenes qualities today in our world, either as a philosopher or as a politician, or is there anybody that you know? Uh, if you ask the question uh, 10 or 20 years ago, I would have said uh, there was a very famous uh, Romanian philosopher who lived in France um, most of his life, Emile Cioran. Chor I don't know how you say it in English. Cioran. C-I-O-R-A-N. Suron. Emilio. Emil, yes, Suron. He was from? He was from Romania. Okay, I have to look it up. Okay. And, um, and, and, he, and he, was, he was kind of uh, um, extremely efficient in philosophical aphorisms and extremely cruel and cynic in a modern way, in the way he was looking at, at modern society. So he was unbuilding, deconstructing lots of uh, uh, structures of the social life and the, of the behavior, lots of uh, illusions, uh, fake ideals, etc. So I would say he is maybe the kind of uh, mentor, philosophical, the, the last huge mentor who, who, to answer your question, could be compared in a way. Uh, he never uh, married, as far as I know. Uh, he lived a very um, uh, frugal life, very modest life in Paris, uh, more or less until the end of his life. So he never worked. <laughs> he never worked, he, except he was writing books, but he was not really considering himself as a writer. So, um, so, so maybe it would be a, a, a kind of a, a good parallel or good match uh, for that in that way. Okay, well, I guess, so as we conclude, I guess, um, and again, the book really helped me understand this because at first you might just look at, as some do, as, as Diogenes' life as a kind of uh, performance art. Um, and, yes. and then it's, you go, okay, well, that doesn't mean anything. And then you go, well, performance art can indeed and is designed to affect you, to make you think, to reflect on your own behavior and your own lifestyle. So I, I would say, I would ask you, I have my own opinion, but if so, again, going back to what the reader can take away, what life lessons do you think Diogenes has for us today? And do you think that's an important aspect of your work as opposed to a history of his life? 
and a recitation of all these anecdotes and things that could have happened or might have happened. Are you also interested in providing the reader a form of sorts in which to learn and think about their own lives? Was that part of your purpose as an author? When when you do uh, yes to answer you sh uh, shortly when 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 I I, I do a portrait because I, I did a Diogenes portrait but I did others uh, when I do a portrait yes there is always the the, the idea that the um, the the character could be inspiring in some way uh, so so but I I do my best not to uh, orientate the 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 way you could use. The, the character meaning that you uh, the idea is to provide uh, the history of a character and to let people um, pick what uh, um, fit or match their uh, their interest or their philosophy uh, aspiration so I think it's really important not to try to be in any way a, a guru uh, of uh, uh, history of philosophy. Maybe philosophers do that, but historians we try not to. Uh, quite, I'm quite sure. Uh, and uh, so this is this is uh, this is the situation. Yes, I, I I I provide some some ideas and some descriptions to 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 help people uh, think it through. But I let the the end of the process to the to the reader to, to the choice. Of the ideas they want to cope with is uh, their freedom. So, and Diogenes would love the idea that people are free to choose what they want to choose. Well, you did a very good job of it, but you were also smart enough to pick a very entertaining person to uh, give a biography of. So, I really, I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, writing the book. And I'm sure uh, our customers at the bookstore and the people who are listening to this broadcast will appreciate it as well. So, thanks so much, John Manuel. Thank, thank you so much, Sam. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Goodbye.